Hi, I'm Courtney Kachuba. I'm part of the marketing team at Samuel French. Thank you so much for coming on behalf of our partners, which is the wonderful Vineyard Theater we're in right now. How great. They've been wonderful. Their staff is scattered around. Um, How Round, which do you all know How Round online? Yes, I'm seeing heads nod and shake. They're doing a live stream actually right now. Hi, live stream people. So everybody can cheer really loudly for them. Uh, (laughs) And then finally, Playbill, which this is our first year collaborating with Playbill, and it's been tremendous. So thank you, Playbill. There's a Playbill station right there. This is our third year of panel events, actually. It is the first time that it's in a space this big, um, and the first year on identity. Were any of you in the past two years, did you come to any of ours, Rights Week, Musicals Week? Yeah, Yeah, we got some, there we go. Um, So if you wanna learn more about those panels and or about the panels that are coming up tomorrow, Thursday, and Friday, plus there's a whole companion series of essays that are on tonight, is um, written by Larissa Fasthorse, Um, There's a whole bunch of great essays that are going on. Go to playbill.com backslash identity week and you can see a bunch of great stuff there. Also, I'm going to give a shout out to our social media because if you had your picture taken by Christian, who's right there, uh, that'll be up on our Facebook tomorrow. Um, So just a few housekeeping chores. First, please silence the cell phones, but do not turn them off because if you are a tweeter, we would love for you to tweet with us during this. I'm going to be sitting up in the last row, live tweeting what these wonderful people say. Um, The Wi-Fi, because you might need it, especially if you're down in the front row, VT2, and it's all lowercase vineyard is the password. So if you want to log into that now. You can use hashtag Identity Week, and you can follow us on Twitter. We'll be tweeting. It's at Mr. Samuel French, and I am proud to say, because of Identity Week, we're changing at Mr. Samuel French to just Samuel French NYC. That's happening next week, so stay tuned. No more Mr. We don't need Mr. Uh, (laughs) um, So also, before I bring out our wonderful panelists and moderator, we want to give a huge thanks to them and everybody else who's participating this week. These are some of 
the industry's best and they have a lot of great things to say and we're so glad that you're here to be a part of it. Uh, so I'm going to introduce our moderator is Pippin Parker who is the director of the School of Drama in the New School and he's wonderful and great on Twitter and he's going to introduce the rest of our panelists. So there you go. <laughs> Enjoy. Hi, thank you. Um, geez, I guess I will, uh, let me, uh, let me lob up here. I can do this. Do that upside down. Um, so it's really my pleasure to be here. Really, my tech skills have really gone downhill. It's really, uh, Um, so it's my pleasure to be here, and um, I want to introduce to you, I can't even quite see in the, in back, into the back, but I will <laughs> introduce them by name. So tonight we have a really uh, fantastic panel of um, playwrights, and I'm happy to introduce uh, Lydia Diamond, uh, Damon Shure, Kimberly, and Ray Pamatmat. What? I think, oh, you know, I think, well, we'll see if it's working, but thanks. Uh, Lydia was an actress as well as a playwright, I believe, so you know that. Is that correct? A long, long time ago. Okay. <laughs> long, long time ago. Uh, so, Damon, I want to start with you because about a year ago, I think you wrote, um, I know that you wrote uh, mm -hmm. um, an article, a little essay, mm -hmm. um, and um, for Sam French, French's publication. Mm -hmm. um, called Breaking Character, Breaking Character Magazine, and the piece was called Asian Playwrights and Asian Characters, What's the Deal? Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> uh, I was wondering, I was hoping, because that, that essay helped inspire the, um, the theme for this week's um, identity um, issues. Uh, so I was wondering if you could give us like a little bit of a, you know, a little capsule of that article, why you wrote it, and what, what were you were expressing in that article Got it. or essay. Right, thank yes. you. Um, so what's the deal? Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> the article really is about my journey as a playwright. Um, you know, I grew up in Singapore. I came to this country 20 years ago. I started writing 10 years ago. And really, uh, this is about um, what I choose to write. And when I started, I wrote everything. Uh, but I realized as time went on that, you know, there was a, um, uh, you know, shortage of roles for Asian actors on stage. Um, and I realized that as a playwright, I can actually correct that. So uh, one of my mission, uh, you know, starting from a few years ago was to write uh, plays with more Asian characters. Uh, but beyond that, I also wanted to reflect um, the, you know, the diverse, um, community that is out there. I believe that you know uh, people on stage should reflect you know everything out there. Um, so it's not just about writing Asian characters. It's also writing about all sorts of ethnicity, all sorts of races, all sorts of interests to give underserved voices you know uh, a voice on stage. So so that was what I wrote about. Great. Yeah. And in that in that essay, mm -hmm. you. Um, I think you say that you sort of came to this sensitivity, you arrived at this sort of sensitivity mm -hmm. about the need to provide opportunities for mm -hmm. actors and theater artists of mm -hmm. color. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if that, if that sort of moment or that sort of journey resonates with the rest of you or if you came into playwriting with that already. Gimber? <laughs> <laughs> Eye contact fast enough. <laughs> <laughs> I, what is what what is the question? So in other words, is that something? Is the is the notion if it does resonate with you that that sort of story that Damon told about coming to this sort of realization that there was an opportunity and and almost I think as Damon Damon described it as a sort of a a, a, a sensitivity towards the need to create opportunities for actors of color, theater artists of color. Um, and uh, which he sort of dis mm -hmm. di discovered after he was a playwright. He was already right. writing plays. And I'm right. wondering if that resonates with you or maybe you had a different kind of uh, uh, association with those issues. Yeah, sure. I, I, think, I think that for me, I, I don't know that I, when I came to writing, that I had an overt mission to provide uh, roles for actors of color. I had a great awareness 
uh, of who I was putting on stage when I wrote things, but I think that the things that I wrote and the 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 way that those characters uh, rose to the surface just comes from my life, which I think is, you know, I guess that's part of what we're talking about here is like identity, you know, mm -hmm. like things come from your identity, perhaps even without you thinking about it overtly all the time. Um, it's just part of who I am, it's part of, uh, part of the world that I live in and the world that I'm absorbing around me all the time. Um, uh, but but it, I don't mind that there are people of color populating my plays. You know, that <laughs> doesn't hurt my yeah. feelings. Um, and and it is something you know, perhaps that I've become n not more deliberate about, but but more um, conscious of uh, in the way that I'm conscious of the presence of people of color in every. Uh, in every in every place that I am, I'm I'm always counting. Right. I think you've mentioned Kim Burke that you and were. I'll look to the audience. <laughs> <See ya. laughs> Kimber, you had mentioned, and I just want to uh, get to the getting to identity itself. You had mentioned, I think, uh, Ed read that you were the only Asian American in your school uh, and in your parents' church and in your hometown, and um, I'm wondering if you. Uh, when you came to playwriting or came to theater, did you find it as a, pl a place where you could, and, and that you were, I'm sorry, and that you also had an enormous sort of um, self-enforced uh, notion of trying to fit in, I think. Um, the, was the theater some place that you could get away from that? Or when you came to the theater, did, was there a population of, um, were there um, uh, people like you that you found, or was that a struggle when you, when you came as well? Yeah, I think you yeah. said that you watched Hee Haw in order to fit in. Oh, with your I've been <laughs> researching things. <outside>. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I think that when I came to the theater, it was, um, it was tremendously freeing and um, extremely constraining at the same time because uh, the the sort of range, the range of things, and when, when I think about these issues of identity and representation, I always think about range, because that is the, that is the, um, the, the place where I think difficulty comes in, is if that range is being narrowed to only one story. Um, so for me, and I was an actor before mm -hmm. I was a playwright, um, and so for me as an actor, um, and also being a woman, and also being, you know, of the certain physical <laughs> presence that I am, uh, there were a lot of things that were not available to me, and it took me a really long time to figure out that, oh, that's because I'm Asian, <laughs> and they, these parts are not meant for me. Um, these places are maybe not meant for me, um, and so then it becomes this question of like, okay, so what do we do about that? Where do I participate? All right. I want to back into a question about casting, um, which we were talking about a little bit before we came out. But um, Lydia, in in Smart People, you have you have a character in the in the play who's an African American actress, actor, female, and um, and she, like the other characters, is sort of seems to be struggling with what that means, how much her identity, her racial identity, informs her character, and how much it should, how it's perceived. What you know. How did that, um, the creation of that character and that sort of world of people, um, how intentional was that to address these issues of identity and what was your uh, sort of process of going through that? Well, it was deeply intentional because it was my, the play, Smart People, was about race. Uh, it's so interesting because in those moments of paranoia in the green room, <laughs> I was like, wow, I'm the only black person on this, am I supposed to be? Did they think I was Asian American? <laughs> <laughs> and then I was. If you like, do well at the end of well, this, you can be an honorary well, Asian American. <laughs> and then the thing is that in my play, Smart People, one of the things that made me the most uncomfortable was that I have a character who's Asian American, uh -huh. and there's a very disturbing scene that is very much about playing with the, the tensions of race and identity. But through the process of making the play and with the actors who helped develop the play with me over the course of seven years, 
there was the I I struggled with um, the question about what I'm huh. there's a there's a scene in which a, a woman who I'm so is so confessional right. I'm so <laughs> uncomfortable a woman who a woman who is um, Chinese and Japanese American has a scene in which she goes down on her white boyfriend and the scene is in my mind a very complicated and disturbing scene purposefully to serve a political paradigm of the play but as you can see I think the stage note is it's disturbing well yes <laughs> but but disturbing yeah. for someone who for the last 20 years my whole thing has been about race and being very conscious of the images I put on stage and what they meant and like you were saying who I don't get to see on stage and I thought, well, I never get to see, I don't often get to see Asian American women be like this empowered person. She's a psychiatrist at Harvard. And, um, and so the politics of what that means d just undid me. And it's so funny because I was a teacher for nine years at Boston University. And we had conversations about identity all the time with my students. And it was generally white students because you know, that's why we have panels like this. <laughs> and I would say, you know, it's the character and embrace the difference and it's fine and blah, blah, blah. And so I didn't know that I would have this sense of um, identity crisis in, in the coming of the making of my art. You're not having an identity crisis right now? A little bit. Okay. <laughs> yeah. no, not an identity crisis, but just an awareness. Mm -hmm. You know, and it wouldn't matter how, and I would have this with African American plays because I write so much about class. Mm -hmm. So I would write a play about um, African Americans in, you know, in three different classes in one house. And I would think, what if I'm not, I'm, I'm deemed by other African Americans not African American enough or classist or whatever. So there's, it's not a neurosis that's limited to mm -hmm. my portrayal of an Asian American woman on stage. But I, I would say I, I have a certain sense of authority when I move through the world, when we talk about a uh, race in terms of black and white. And I'm very uncomfortably aware that so often the conversation about race is in black and white. Mm -hmm. mm. And um, mm. so I'm very conscious of that right now. Well, this has been, you know, it's, it, this past year has really been the conversation, I, I feel, I, and it might only, this might be completely superficial or my only awareness, um, personal awareness, but it feels like the conversation about Asian American theater artists has really um, uh, been very um, resonant this past year. And there were a couple of incidents, there was the Mikado, and uh, um, to a certain degree, I think Lloyd Sue's um, play. Um, in Pennsylvania, where um, the casting of characters, and particularly Asian American actors, has become, and the representation of Asian American, Asian and Asian American characters on stage has become a very provocative discussion. And um, Damon, I was um, thinking of your, um, the uh, experience that you had with a, um, uh, a producer who was going to do a reading of your play. Um, Green tea, black coffee, or is it the black other way? Coffee, black green coffee, tea. green tea. <laughs> yeah. Black coffee, green tea, which called for three Asian American actors and an African American actor. One yeah, African American. One African American. American. Yeah. Might you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah. This is a short play, um, you know, black coffee, green tea, and uh, a producer just wanted to do a reading of this, and I gave permission, assuming that they would cast three Asians and one African American, except after giving the permission the producer wrote to me and said, oh, you know, we are a small company and we can only afford this number of actors, all of them are white, so if you don't mind, we're gonna cast four white people to be in this play about three Asians and one African American. <laughs> so, you know, when you're confronted by things like this, you just say, thank you, but no thank you, and you try to explain why, you know, and then hopefully that un they understand why, and so that was a real experience for me. And eventually, and you pulled the... Yes, I pulled the rights. You pulled yeah. the rights for yeah. that. And I think that there's a, you know, the question, I think, it provokes the question about what that experience is and, and the sort of authenticity aspect of, um, uh, of casting. But it also, it was interesting, because I know 
I know, Kimber, that you have talked about theater sometimes being siloed, so the feeling that sometimes a theater company, not the vineyard, but a theater company somewhere may be doing, say, like the Asian play, and that is the play that has a Asian or Asian American playwrights and Asian American performers for an Asian audience, and that you have sometimes felt that it's too kind of um, separated, that the, that the diversity is really not, um, not intermingled, but that it's trying to reach different audiences instead of having a common conversation. And this question isn't actually to you, but to Ray, because I wondered. <laughs> and Ray, you've <laughs> talked about, uh, just to bring in another aspect of it, Ray, you've talked about your, uh, about coming out in high school and you felt it was not a, seemed like a non-traumatic event. I wondered as both an um, uh, Asian American writer and a gay writer, have you um, experienced that, do you feel it siloed and do you feel like you've had to um, identify yourself as one or the other or both and is there a world in the theater for multiple identities? I mean, I do, I, I do think it's siloed. I think that, I mean, and that, I, that's not even really a thought. We know that it's siloed. Mm -hmm. we, we can see it in, you know, in seasons. We can see it in theaters. You know, we can see it in funding for theaters. We mm -hmm. know that it's siloed. We, we're kidding ourselves if, if we're going to pretend that it isn't. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that with what I've been writing in particular, you know, because I've been told that my plays aren't Asian enough or that my plays aren't gay enough. You know, and um, and I always counter that really that's about the other person's limited ideas of what a gay or Asian American play is, mm -hmm. and not actually about the play that I've written. I have noticed recently that, um, you know, I, I haven't really changed the way that I write. I, I, I think all of my plays are gay. I think they are all Asian American. <laughs> and, you know, I don't care <laughs> whether people, you know, whether people agree. Uh, they are, because I wrote them. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and I have noticed that the conversation about intersectionality has become just much larger within first in academic circles and then within artistic circles and now sort of within mass culture that people get it a lot more, and so now when people encounter my plays, they are more open to the idea that it could be dealing with multiple things mm -hmm. and doesn't have to mm -hmm. uh, doesn't have to discuss those things in a particular way in order to be deemed about that. Um, that so does I, feel like it's getting better to you. If to me, it feels like it's getting better. It just feels like there are more, you know, and it, it's it. I feel like because people are more open to it, we're encountering new problems, and so it sometimes it feels worse because we have start to have, we have to have conversations and arguments that we didn't have to have before. But uh, I feel like before that, people would just be like, oh, that's, I don't know what that is. And, <laughs> and then just sort of shove it aside. And now they're like, oh, I kind of get it. And you know, we're, hmm. we're, trying to work, we're trying to work our way through it. Hmm. I think in, um, uh, Lydia, you talked in Smart People about think uh, and the play takes place at the uh, on the uh, right around the ele the uh, 2008 election right. of Obama so it's the first the Obama first election one. and you sort of toy with the notion having the characters tease out the question of whether we're entering a post-racial world and um, I'm wondering if you reflect back on that what your thoughts are and how that um, what that looks like in uh, in context of I'll theater. Try, I'll try to actually answer your question this time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a question, it's a provocation. It's, uh, <laughs> um, I think that, so I started writing the play before the election because I wrote so, I write so slowly. I knew I was writing a play that was very self-consciously about race. And um, then I wrote it so slowly that the election happened and it completely <laughs> shifted the paradigm about how race gets talked about and then people started being self-congratulatory and talking about post-racial. Mm -hmm. And I was writing a play in the middle of all of that. Um, and so the characters in the play aren't confused about post-racial, but the play is aware that there's this dynamic. And it was it's actually right, at the, right before the post-racial, mm -hmm. uh, but the play is, is sort of yeah, it's on the cusp of what is about to be called post-racial, and it's so clearly in a world that is never going to be post-racial. And what are your thoughts about that in terms of theater itself? Yeah, post-racial? Mm-hmm. 
There's no post-racial. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I don't. I don't have. There's no gray area. It's not nuanced to me, as evidenced by sitting on these panels. Mm -hmm. um, we sit on these panels. All I've sat on these panels with you, all the time, and for 20 years I've been sitting on panels and we talk about race. And I don't think white people sit on panels and talk about race very much. So clearly, there's there's stuff that needs to be worked on. Mm -hmm. And what is it? Let's um, just to follow that up. What is it that needs to be worked on? Why is it not happening? Or what is happening? How how slow or fast is the progress? You know, what's your sort of That's take on really that? That's a really big question. Mm -hmm. um, societally, I think, you know, I think theater is, isn't, we, we flatter ourselves to think that we're somehow more liberal than the masses. And if this week isn't, you know, if this year isn't a, an example of how deeply, uh, how, how much we're fooling ourselves about our, our universal liberalism, right? Um, and I think that the theater is as racist and as classist as anywhere else in America. And in some ways maybe more so because we congratulate ourselves and think that we aren't. Um, I think it, it um, needs to be examined and critiqued and I don't even know what your question is anymore. <laughs> well, I think it's deeply, deeply problematic. Mm -hmm. uh, just, just that when I go to the theater so often I am the only person of color in the theater, sometimes the only person of color watching my play mm -hmm. in the theater, mm -hmm. and then I feel like the conversation that theaters have, a, you know, is how can we fix this? But it's been a conversation that theaters have had for a long time, which makes me think, well, how much investment really is there in fixing it? And maybe it's not broken. Maybe it's, you know, maybe there needs to be a completely different paradigm. What is that? I don't know. Yeah. yeah. So I think that, I mean, it brings up a question that I think we, we circle around a lot, which is, is theater this sort of rarefied thing that has an audience, you know, like ballet or opera or something that, that is, you know, only in, in some shades a popular form, but also, a, you know, a sort of a niche form? Or are there structures in place that are really, um, you know, keeping, keeping it um, more, uh, you know, more, uh, blander and more uniform than 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 we'd like it to be. Have you guys faced situations that you feel are sort of structural in that way that you couldn't sort of break I'll through? I'll try. I'll try to to answer. I'm not sure if I'm, yeah. I'm going to answer the right question. I'm not sure I um, asked the right question. <laughs> but, <you> know, <laughs> I, I I think you know uh, talking about the totality totality of theater. I think there is professional and non-professional theater. And I think where there's less gate gatekeeping involved, I think it's flourishing. I think mm -hmm. there's a lot of stuff happening out there. Maybe we don't see it, but it is out there. But I think when you talk about more of the professional theater, which is more curated, I think there's more of a gatekeeping. And maybe that's where uh, change needs to happen more. Yeah. And there's an economic component, of course, for artists. If there, if there are gates being kept in the places where you can actually almost feed your families to work, then that, you know that's a gate that in any other sort of sphere professionally you could actually sue the profession for being not inclusive. So, you know, you could call it niche or you could call it white supremacy. I was up late watching the debates. <laughs> <laughs> Kim, I feel like you're about to say something. I, I mean, I think that in one way, if you wanted to, <laughs> you could look at the structures that exist in the American theater and you could say to yourself, ah, these structures uh, resemble the structures that exist in our country institutionally, as a nation, how we were founded, how our government was set up to function. And everyone likes to talk about how broken things are, the government's broken, the American theater is broken, and I would actually 
say that perhaps it is functioning exactly the way it was built to function, which is to protect the interests and the advancement of a certain population of people, which does not include uh, you know, diverse points of view, we'll say, by and large, the points of view of people of color, the, t the, the ways in which um, storytelling uh, shifts in those cultures, mm -hmm. in, you know. So I, I kind of feel like if, it, 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 and it is this thing where it's the same, we, we have these panels, we have these conversations, and we all are very honest with each other, and we all do our best to communicate across what seems to be this perpetual divide. Um, and then we go away, and the machine continues to function the way that it functions. And so I don't have answers for any of this, but I, I, my questions start to be around what are the foundational causes that keep these structures in place and how do we address those? And until that happens, we'll continue to sit on panels, which, you know, it's nice to have a bottle of water. <laughs> but, um, you know, as far as change is concerned, I think that there's a, there's a, there's a difference that's necessary in the way that we're looking at what we perceive to be the problem. Mm -hmm. Let me ask a little bit of a provocative question and a little outside the, the realm of theater specifically, but um, it's interesting as more and more television has been produced in New York and as television has provided, has become much more interested, well, let's say they've found the value of playwrights, it seems, over the last few years. If you guys have noticed that relationship and what that might mean for for you as playwrights? Are you just doing TV? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's interesting too, right? Because that goes back to what we were talking about, about how race, because, you know, our country can only wrap its mind around, you know, a very simple idea of what race is, and so you know, all of the black people, we have a month, you know, we have February, so that's, <laughs> that's nice, but there are only the same five of us trying to get the February slot. Mm -hmm. Still, we do have a month. And, and, and I, say, I say that, uh, so yes, I have, been, I have uh, put my big toe into the world of television, and I've just recently, I think I've taken it out because I'm too slow at writing, and because of this idea of, uh, white people defining what black is supposed to look like in the media. And so there's a degree to which I feel a certain amount of, of uh, responsibility, right? Like mm -hmm. beyond that you win the lottery, if you should get a television series, there, we need the people writing the television series that give a broad depiction of who we all are in America, right? But there's a, there's, you bump your head against a, this system that you were talking about that is defining for us who we are. Because, you know, when you, when we, uh, again, and I'm sorry, uh, we're so, we, we obviously are, I, I, I won't speak for you. <laughs> I came to be on this, I put on makeup to be on the panel. I'm not resentful of being on the panel, but I was on a panel about this, and I was on a panel about this in Seattle two days ago. And um, see, I've lost my words. It's the debate. Right. You're talking, about, you're talking about the 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 responsibility that you feel in television, but maybe also in theater. Well, for, okay. For so I guess when of, we have we have all these thousands and thousands and thousands of television channels now, right? Minus even the ones about reality TV, and still they are not reflective even of just the demographic on this stage in any kind of substantive way. So. It, it, it feels like with television you can reach a larger audience, and that's great, but it certainly isn't s more progressive than, than the theater and the, the structures that keep it inclusive of a small group of people are, are, this, are the same structures, but with more money. Yeah, right.
Kimber, Kimber, earlier you mentioned something about different types of plays or different types of storytelling based on different cultures. I wonder if you could sort of address that a little bit. I, and it seemed like a little bit what you were alluding to was the sort of, um, you know, uh, well-made play, sort of canonical Western play, if, if that's what you were alluding to, as opposed to other ways of telling stories, which are maybe newer to the theater or that um, are still um, younger to, to, the, to the, you know, the theater world in our yeah. sense. I, I think, I think so. I mean, I, I think, I think that there is a way in which there uh, are, there's a, there's a very specific group of people who get to make the decision about what is presented as a good play or a worthy play. And, and that can often look like a certain type of thing. And if the way that you write does not fit into that mold, um, it is, it, it, it can be dismissed as being not valid. Um, so it, it, it has to do with, um, you know, we all grow up in our own little microcultures in our families. Um, but then also within the greater community that we are that we are from, and, and all of those things influence the way that we receive and tell story. So um, having a having a, a wider door, I guess, for everybody to kind of go through together is something that that seems to be very challenging. Um, and I don't I don't I don't blame artistic directors or literary managers or any of the traditional gatekeepers in the way of like, well, it's just their fault because they're so narrow-minded. Mm -hmm. I understand that there are, there are challenges and that there are audiences because the audience is always the thing, right? I mean, the, the play is meant to be in a conversation with an audience. And if the audience, you know, it, it gets back to this question of like, who are the people that are watching the play? When Lydia goes to see her play and she's the only person of color, what is the com conversation that's happening? What, what conversation mm -hmm. can that play have? It's a, lot, it's a blander conversation. It's a more exciting conversation, right? Right, yeah. right. Yeah. And Ray, I think you were, you worked at the public, if I'm right, right? Didn't I you? did, yeah. 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 So you were both then before you. Capacity. Okay, yeah, yeah, I couldn't remember. I mean, what was it like, even in the non-artistic capacity, you working inside an institution, I think, before you won the Pony well, actually, Award? I mean, if actually I could talk a little about what Kimber was saying. Sure. You know, just because, it, as the co-director of the My Writers Lab, mm -hmm. you know, we sit, you know, we meet every two weeks, we hear a vast number of plays by writers, we hear all of the different things that they're writing, the things they're experimenting with, the things that we're playing with, and of course, you know, we follow each other to figure out what plays are getting done, right? Mm -hmm. And so from this broad <clears throat> number of plays that people are writing, ultimately the plays that are getting done uh, from an Asian American or Asian and Asian American playwriting lab are the plays about ethnicity. So people will do the plays that the lab members have written about fit, basically you know, fitting into a culture that is not Asian American. Uh, you know, but they won't do like someone's sci-fi play or someone's boxing play or someone's, you know, like those are not the plays that are getting done mm -hmm. by Asian American artists. Although, you know, although other artists of other ethnicities, those plays are getting done all the time. Mm -hmm. And so I think a little bit of what Kimber's talking about is that, you know, if you, so if you happen to have a play that fits into this sort of ethnography or immigration or cultural identity slot or idea about what the conversation is about Asian Americans to people who are not Asian American, mm -hmm. then there is a chance that your play will get done. But if you're Asian American and you write about NASCAR, then that one just, you chuck that one. That, you know, that's right. for you. Right. That's your pet project. Right. Right. Because no one's ever going to do your NASCAR play. Right. And you know? the presumption yeah. that your NASCAR play isn't colored by right. your experience of being right. whoever you are in this culture. Yeah. There, there's a, yeah, I, f I feel like there is 
a feeling of like, ah, we're bringing in this Asian American playwright. We would like you to do something Asian American <laughs> for us. <laughs> 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 so you, I'm just gonna say, you're suggesting that there's sort of one story. No, I became very conscious of, um, I, I feel like I am, I am having a certain level of bitterness that I think that I don't have as much as I feel like it's coming out right now. Mm -hmm. And it is also because I, I have had the privilege of being inside and sort of all through and in uh, institutions, and I do, I do understand that it's complicated. I think where I have a problem is when there's, where there, when there's disingenuousness about it. Mm -hmm. I, I get mm -hmm. it if you wanna be like, you know, we're, we're a white theater company, and at this theater company we do white plays and we have a white audience. It becomes disingenuous when y you say, I just can't figure out how to get a diverse audience but you don't really want one, or you only want one contained in the amount of time and the space that you want one, and you want that audience to match that play, but in that little piece of time. And that's what makes me kind of crazy, and I think that my frustration is fueled by that, that the, I said I was on a panel in Seattle, but it was a panel made up of all black female playwrights. And so we've been, you know, drinking and stewing. So, <laughs> so I'm all worked up. <laughs> but, but it's a similar, it, it strikes me that it's a similar experience to getting back to the casting question when you hear, you know, we tried to cast, we tried to, we put out a notice, and the, and the sort of disparity between um, the kind of um, development and cultivation and really nurturing of a community and, um, and wanting to be inclusive in a limited kind of way. So Lydia, what you're saying is that there's a lot of, to me it sounds like there's a lot more work than just kind of um, um, maybe disingenuously or naively throwing out um, an opportunity in a, in, a, in a limited kind of way as opposed to the ongoing work that it would, that it would take. And we're all too smart as theater people to be naive. We're not naive, we're really, really brilliant, so. I, I think that, the, that there's a piece to that as well that has to do with accountability. And I do think that there's a lot of anxiety around all of this. And, and the anxiety that you expressed about including an Asian American character in smart people. Um, so I, I think all of us are feeling our way through these types of questions, but it feels to me like if there is to be a lack of dis disingenuousness, if there's, if there's, if if people, if people are being authentic about their intentions and what they really want to be doing, that accountability is the key component of that. Accountability with the community that you are, a of all, representing to a larger world, and that is that carries with it a, a great responsibility mm -hmm. for what you are representing. Um, and, then, and then an accountability with the community. If it is not your community, an accountability with the community that you're representing, so they have a voice in that representation. And then I feel like that extends to this idea of, if you have gone to great lengths to bring the black community in, in February to see the, <laughs> the play in February, how much of an effort are you making to bring that same community in when you do your, you know, George, George Shaw play? You know what I mean? It's like if you, um, if you are going to extend yourself, it seems to me that it would be advantageous to try to continue to bring those audiences in the door and extend that invitation to them just as vigorously for the rest of your season. And for no other reason than that the art is then better. Yeah. Because you know, you talked about that, uh, the, uh, smart people and my anxiety. Um, I was afraid maybe that I was here so you could all tell me how horrible that, that representation was. Because <laughs> obviously I'm a narcissist. <laughs> 
<laughs> I saw the play twice, but it's fine. Did you like it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I saw it again to be angry. No, I love well, it. Well, you know. I love it. But how do I, like, how do you have that conversation in a, in a, when you're being workshopped or when you're being presented in a place that it doesn't give the diversity enough to have the juicy conversation? Like, through the development over the too many years of smart people, mm -hmm. I got to develop it with five Asian American actresses. Mm -hmm. And that was my, you know, not that I didn't do my due diligence, but there, there isn't a, a, a diverse world even in which we can all become more sophisticated around all of this, so. And so, in, and the, um, when you had that experience, or maybe for all of you, it, it sounds like the ability to work with, um, it's not only the, the, the management of theater companies, the selection of material, but really the um, opportunity to work with other theater artists, you know, and the collaborative part of it, which Lydia, you were saying, was so helpful to you as you were developing that. And I wonder if that's also, for the rest of you, part of the attraction of theater and part of the frustration you know, that you've, um, that you've felt as, as someone who's trying to be in there as a collaborative artist. I just want to strike a note of optimism here, <laughs> <laughs> because it's all uh, you know, gloom and doom. Um, you know, I was recently a member of the Emerging Writers Group at the Public Theater, and uh, you know, I don't know whether it's an, an exception, but they've been doing very diverse programming. Uh, they've had great successes. So it's not about, oh, if we put on this play, nobody's going to come to see. Well, everybody has seen Hamilton, right? So, so I think there is a conversation around that that needs to happen for other theater companies mm -hmm. to see what the public theater is doing. And you know, I, I experienced some of that from the inside. And you know, it was great to be an Asi Asian playwright, you know, working with a very diverse group of artists within that space. Yeah, I didn't even feel it was all gloom and doom until you said that. Oh. <laughs> he can just feel yeah. the gloom vibrating off of oh. me. <laughs> <laughs> And, and you know, it's funny because I've been in this most incredibly beautiful rehearsal space mm -hmm. at the 42nd, you know, um, with these gorgeous, brilliant actors and this wonderful director. And how lucky are we to be theater artists? Yes. Um, but I think even the, um, the complexity of, of being asked, you know, not being asked, but putting ourselves in the position of saying, I'm going to be vulnerable enough to slap really hard the hands that feed me um, because I know that we're all doing our very best, that in and of itself is very specific to the population of artists of color because more than we're asked to talk about the aesthetic of our work, um, we're, we're asked to um, be very honest about something that's a very dangerous thing to be honest about. Um, and well, well, let me ask you a little. To no end, to, I say that. Yeah. Okay. Mm. I mean, we have right. to be able to, you know, in, in a way, when we talk about our own work, we have to be able to position our work for other people to understand it. Because a lot of times, you know, like however savvy an artistic staff is, or a theater is, or an audience is, you know, sometimes it may, it, you know, whatever play of mine they're doing, it might be the first queer Filipino American play they've ever done. No. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, it be, you know, so like just I'm as. It, <laughs> <laughs> May. I don't know. <laughs> so, like, you know, so I, artists of color, in a way that other, you know, artists don't, or queer artists often have to go into a theater and not just write their play, finish their play, go to rehearsals, make sure everything's working, but then figure out how they're going to position their play, how they're going to talk about it when they're on this panel, how they're going to talk about it with journalists who do not understand or are asking bizarre questions <laughs> or, you know, like <laughs> about, you know, ethnicity or sexuality or gender, you know, and, and I, so it, it becomes a, there, there, are, there are some extra jobs in, you know, in, in being able to create work. So do you feel, do you, it, 
it seems like what you're saying is that not only do you have to be the playwright, um, which is the obvious part, but that it, you have a certain responsibility of bringing, uh, and I think Damon might have talked about this a little bit, of bringing the cultural <coughs> context um, to into <coughs> excuse me into the rehearsal room, so that you have an, almost another level of responsibility on top of delivering the the text and letting it be um, interpreted in the in the more traditional sense. Would you like to get away from that? Is that a is that something you like? Is it a burden? Is it you know? It makes my writing better. That you have that you are <coughs> that you that I that I have had to that I have had the privilege to move through the world having to be very dexterous about how I navigate or uh, keep myself safe or keep the people around me safe or be utterly offensive to the people around me or whatever, I have a hyper-consciousness around my identity uh, it, it, as an African-American woman moving through the world. And I think that that's what playwrights are asked to have. We, we're, we have to, and so um, th that's, that's a, pr a privilege. Um, complicated as it may be, I think, I think it makes my writing better. I take seven years to write plays sometimes. <laughs> yeah. But because it is a tricky thing to unpack. And the rest of you, do you have similar feelings about that? Um, oh, go ahead. I think it's fun most of the time. <laughs> Honestly, I, I do. I think it's, I, I do think it's fun. Not just, uh, uh, you know, I, okay, so this, okay. 10% evil, a little bit of evil. It's fun catching people sometimes, you know? Like, <laughs> but then like the, the part of that that's not evil is that when you do catch people, then it, it, you know, you can see, you can sometimes see in the audience like little light bulbs go off. Like I, I've been asked on more than one occasion why I write Filipino characters. <laughs> and I love to, I, I love saying to people who ask that question, especially in large public forums, I like saying, <laughs> you would never ask a white writer why they're writing white characters. You know, and so, and, and even like just that, you know, just that moment when you're there and you're in front of a bunch of people and you see all of these people go like, oh, no, you wouldn't, you wouldn't do that. <laughs> and you know, to, for them to start to understand um, what, what you're doing, what you're trying to do by creating these worlds that people can latch into mm -hmm. and you know, and in trying to build empathy with people that they don't know or people that they don't like or you know or showing you know those you know showing people like me trying to develop empathy with people they don't know or don't like you mm -hmm. know it's 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 fun sometimes and a it, little evil <laughs> <laughs> I mean I mean I think it's it's um it's what it's it's what it's what Lydia was talking about. It's it's um, this idea that that speaking the truth will sometimes feel may sometimes feel like a slap in the face to certain institutions um, where we have to make our bread and butter. But if those institutions are serious about extending an invitation to have a real conversation, these are this this that that Ray was talking about is also part of that conversation. And what gets us to the table is being, um, being authentic with each other mm -hmm. about what our intentions are and what we are really there for. So, so that's where that can happen. Once we have all come to the table in an authentic way, then we can have these conversations where there's an exchange mm -hmm. and there's learning on both sides. So. And I hazard to guess that we've, everyone up here, we've all had those very fruitful and um, mm -hmm. um, brave relationships you you know if you ask me talk to me about race in america i'm gonna get angry <laughs> and i'm gonna say some things but that that doesn't negate that i have appreciated and continue to appreciate the people the white people the white institutions who have partnered with me to start making it better um but it doesn't it hasn't made it go away so of course i'm gonna be not happy about it. That's a really difficult, you know, bifurcated consciousness mm -hmm. to articulate to someone. Mm -hmm. We in America, we only know how to hear. I'm upset as you're saying I'm doing that to you. 
Yes. And I don't think that it always can mean that. Mm -hmm. It can mean we, we can all acknowledge that there's this thing, this elephant in the room that isn't, that's really big. Elephants are big, <laughs> right? Um, and so how, how we, can't, we can't fix it if we're all so uncomfortable that we can't fix it. I wonder. Was that profound sounding or yeah. just it's good. deep? It's good. It's good. It's good. <laughs> I mean, talking about this, you know, extra responsibility, I, I don't know whether it's fair or not fair, but I think it's always an opportunity to have, you know, like what everyone say, an exchange. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I take it upon myself to really, uh, if somebody seems to be kind of putting me in a box and they may not realize it, um, you know, illuminate that to them. And actually, it does open up a, a new conversation. And, and I like to do that, but I tend to do it in a very tactful way. So sometimes it's a lot of responsibility. Um, you know, again, whether that's fair or not fair, I'm okay with it. Right. And in the, on the, in the other, so the flip side of that is in your writing, so what we're discussing is really this sort of exchange of ideas and expectations and notions between people and institutions and, and artists. But I wonder, as artists yourself, do you have to get over the fact that you may that your work may be perceived as representing something bigger than you? And what I, what I, what I have a specific moment in Smart People, and I have no idea what this was like for you, but in which the character of Valerie, who's an actor, is auditioning for a play. It's a very specific type of African-American, at least dialect. I don't know what your intention was there, but I wondered about that sort of notion of representation. And did you feel, were you worried about what the that reaction was, was going to be? That was the first question that I didn't answer. It was? Right? That was the first question. <laughs> uh, that was a, a tangent to the first you question. Yes. Right. Um, That's my that was hazard good. of no, being a I, writer. I, yes. um, Valerie is a, a, an African-American actress who's navigating being an African-American actress and the opportunities to her that are limited because of it. And um, so I, I, the scene that what he's speaking of is, is hilarious. And she goes to an audition, and she's given a side uh, of who she's going to audition for. And But when she gets there, they see her, and they have said, uh, oh, this is the side that you want to be reading. And it's not uh, what she prepared. And it's mm. like a very um, uh, um, urban accented um, trope, I guess. <laughs> and, and so there's great comedy in her sort of trying to do it and you know, being a black girl from the suburbs trained at white institutions, kind of being able to code switch off the page in a cold reading and kind of not. And <laughs> all of the things, it, you know, and it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> it's great comedy. Um, we only have about five minutes left, and I wanted to find out if there's any, any of you guys who have questions for our panelists. So we don't have a, a microphone, but I can repeat. Either you can use your good from the diaphragm voice, or I can repeat the question <laughs> back for our live stream, et cetera. So. Um, or are we too shy? I can barely, barely see out in the house. All right. Yes, there's someone in the third row. Hi. No, you. Yes. Yes. Um, Hi. 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 I was wondering, um, you touched on the kind of of the audience and being the only African-American woman in the audience, and, and I have that experience as well. Um, and I'm just wondering, as playwrights, do you feel like you have any sort of agency in including more people in the audience for shows, whether that's doing, I've seen I've over talked. I, I, um, okay, so the the question was, as a playwright or a theater artist coming in and having your work produced within an institution, what kind of agency or power you might have to uh, encourage the institution to diversify their audience, whether it's through um, discounted tickets or other kinds of outreach to the community broader than the standard, um, you know, uh, homogeneous audience that tends to show up for theater. I think it really depends on, um, first of all, it depends on if it's a world premiere and if you're a part of the process. And and um, oftentimes, the different theaters have different 
uh, levels of participation that they offer to playwrights and certainly as a, as a playwright you can ask for things and I've been at theaters where we asked and said we would love to provide tickets so that we can um, offer uh, seats to members of this community so that they can they can make it in. I have to name check Long Wharf Theater because they produced a play of mine and they did kind of almost a full year long of outreach mm -hmm. and removing barriers so that people who did not traditionally attend shows at Long Wharf would be able to come and participate in the not only in the show but in a day long event wherein their community leaders would come into the theater and um, have cross community discussions about things that were happening within their community. Um, and it felt to me like it was something that was very community driven and it was a, a, a real invitation and that they used the play as a point of departure. So that was something that they did, but, but different theaters have various levels of, um, <coughs> of ability and also uh, <laughs> intention for, for doing, extending themselves in that way. And, and then um, because the, what you were saying, because the institutions are so behemoth and move slowly, I've partnered with many great uh, theater companies who have worked hard, and together we see how the structure makes it a, a push. You know, the Huntington Theater Company, they've always partnered with me to, to you know, reach out to the community, and they have uh, I think since Peter Dubois especially has been artistic director, there's been a great consciousness around that. Um, Boston is a very polarized city. It's Boston. And, um, and there are things, in, structural things in place like, um, and this is not just specific, this is regional theater, uh, uh, subscription base. So let's say you do make every black person in the city come to your play well, the subscriptions have already been sold, and if it's a hit, they're going to use their tickets, and so where do all of those black people go to see the play? And, 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 I, and I have watched the Huntington kind of do this, we're going to figure this out with every production, and you know, so it, it is not unheard of, and I don't know, one of the conversations I was having in Seattle with all the African American women playwrights is the many different hats that we where as produced playwrights because suddenly you do need to have some marketing savvy and you do need to be able to have a good relationship with your artistic director and say hey if I can get in there to your marketing I could I could tell them that if they put this on the poster it'll be deeply offensive you know <laughs> things like that yes great another question that looks like Peter Quo yes <laughs> <laughs> So I think that, uh, so the question, um, question that was asked is of um, playwrights, I guess the tension between writing from your authentic experience and um, also the desire to explore other characters who may be outside your experience. And um, so that, that's one tension and also the tension um, between an increasing awareness that we want people on stage whose own authentic experiences performers are um, somehow married to uh, the character's performers. I, I, I think my feeling is that if you know, it's all about authenticity, then all you see is going to be biographies on stage. You know, I think that's, you know, if you push it to the extreme. 
And I think you know the human imagination is something that we should celebrate. And you know, from God knows when, I mean, we've, people have been creating different types of characters. So I think you know, um, it's not about that. I think it's about the intention. It's about the work put in to understand what these characters that you're creating, and and empathy for these characters, how real they are. You know, um, so so that would be my response to that. Yeah. I think. I mean, yeah, just. I think when it comes to writing characters outside of your experience, I think a part of what's become difficult is not uh, just the writing of the character, but the that the issue has become so charged that there are many artists who won't uh, react to criticism in <laughs> in a who won't react to criticism in a necessarily healthy way. You, you mean know, like if and, you say you got that wrong, yeah, like they usually, push back. right? Usually, the you know, they're not usually. I shouldn't say usually, but like uh, you know, people become defensive. defensive or afraid, and rather than engaging, you know, they'll, they'll put up a wall, and then the person who asked the question will put up a wall, and suddenly everyone's throwing things over walls, you know, <laughs> and um, and, and I, you know, and, and it, but you know, which strangely, like you know, if someone is like, oh. You know this character that whether it's not a racially charged or you know or sexually charged or whatever issue where it's like oh I just don't believe this person's you know action from beginning to end you go oh okay what 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 lost you you know and then you figure out what to you know what to massage or what to what to change um, you know because I I do actually write a lot of characters that are so far <laughs> out of <laughs> out of what I you know of what I've done in life, mm -hmm. and um, you know, and I have I, I have actually been had conversations where people are upset by what I've represented, and you know, and it's you just I, I feel like you sit down and talk and you learn you figure out how to do it the next time. I have characters in published plays that I regret mm -hmm. what I've done, you know. And um, and I think that uh, you know and if you know and and when those plays do get done, I do actually talk. If I have am in touch with the people doing the play, I talk to them about things that I think are difficult about it, things that I would like to change, you know, or th you know things that I would like to do differently. And I think that's made me a a better writer. And I, I think a lot some writers are afraid to do that. And it just and just really quickly, I'm sorry, I'm talking so much about the queer face thing. I think that is, you know, I think uh, I, I think that's very contextual. You know, like I, I there are absolutely roles that I've written for characters that are GLBT, who I would be fine with a person of any sexuality playing those characters. But then there are particular characters where the experience is so tied up in sexuality or nuances of sexuality or of issues of sexuality beyond even just generally, like a gay issue that is even beyond gay people. Do you know what I mean? Where it's like it's so many steps removed that the only way you're going to get a performance <laughs> that is going to, a crafted performance that will make that character work is if you cast a gay person, you know, then then I then I insist on a, a gay person. Like, and after all the terrible things I do, like mm -hmm. that level of understanding, uh, shame, and you know, and bullying, it's just you need a you need a gay guy to do that, and it's you know, a, a, so, yeah. I, but but there are plenty of characters, like. Uh, Benji and Edith can shoot things and hit them. Oh, actually, that's not true. But <laughs> <laughs> maybe like Kenny, actually Kenny and Edith, like okay. Kenny and Edith. You know, th I don't think that actor has to be gay to play Kenny. One more question, and then we have to wrap up. I'm so sorry. I r almost can't see anything. Okay, in the back, back, second to last yeah. row. Okay. Yes. Uh, I'm going to introduce another kind of person of color. I am Caruso and British. Mm -hmm. I am a writer. There have been many plays that they have said were uh, Caribbean, mm -hmm. but since you have not heard of us standing in great numbers, uh, you know, on the line to see them, then obviously something was missed. Mm -hmm. These were other people writing about us mm -hmm. as a people, but not who we really were, because they didn't know. It was from their perspective. I have written uh, a musical about growing up in this country, speaking of race, on the inside, Caribbean, 
When I go outside, I must be African American because I am not accepted. But I cannot bring that home into a conservative home. Of course, that's not exactly. So what I did, so as not to step on toes, rather than deal with the color, the fact that we're British, I dealt with issues. Issues being bullying through classes. Do you think by my kind of stepping away from all of that, I might still run into problems? So the question, just to repeat it, is um, this is a writer who's um, Caribbean <coughs> and British, um, and um, asking if, um, uh, really from another perspective, another sort of color to the, to the palette of the conversation, um, if she would face similar um, challenges and um, I wonder if, um, if this gets, Lydia, a little bit at your point about the, you alluded to, or you said specifically, do you feel that we have trouble dealing with more than one thing, that we're locked in a kind of binary kind of conversation that it's always, it's black or white. So to right. introduce Asian as a, a complicating a factor. That so that be an African diaspora mm -hmm. that right. is, you know, not just through the middle passage. Absolutely, that's complicated. I think you can do anything you want to do because you're a playwright. And, and um, I think that we live in America, so depending on how the play is cast, or... Uh, oh, diverse, totally diverse. Yeah. I have a black family and a white family, no racial issues. Uh, it, uh, the play is built around bullying through classism. I, I think... And that's I, how I... And I, I think what I was... I think what I was saying was, I don't think that in America you can be immune to other people's assumptions and um, prejudices um, and uh, sensitivities. And so that could fall out well for your play or that could be something that makes you prickly. Um, and it doesn't, I don't know that, I don't know that it matters. I, I, would, I would just add to that as well that, um, the beautiful thing about being a generative artist is that you control your narrative. Mm -hmm. So you do not have to tell your story from the standpoint of an outside gaze. Mm -hmm. Obviously, when an audience comes to see it, they're going to have their reaction, and you can't control that. But what you can control, down to the minutest detail, is your vision, your artistic vision of what it is that you want to express about your experience that you're trying to put into this play. So that's, I mean, I would just encourage you to, to stay true to that, um, because that's the power that we do have, um, is to express what we express, free of the constraint of coming from someone else's perspective. I think that, uh, yeah, and it's also, I think, important to note that we've, you know, today we've said Asian and Asian American, which is a very blunt instrument. I mean, we're talking about a <laughs> huge continent of many, many, many different cultures, and that's as far as we've gotten right now. It's, it's, you know, you know. So there's. I didn't do it. Don't touch me. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> or, it's or very specific. <laughs> or black or African American. There's a lot of ways, and I think there's many more conversations, you know, in the future. But I wonder, just to sort of wrap up, I did wonder from you, from you, um, as playwrights and, and and theater artists, when you sort of squint and can see into the future, if you can, a, a, a theater that seems um, the kind of best version of the theater, what that might look like. We would all make lots and lots of yeah. money. <laughs> <laughs> we would well funded. <laughs> I think that there are young people and companies um, doing it. I think that there are established companies that have been doing it all along. Mm -hmm. And I do think that there's something about economic accessibility. Mm -hmm. So they don't get celebrated. It's companies like Company One, where we've worked, and um, uh, companies like Congo Square in Chicago mm -hmm. and um, company, companies like Penumbra, uh, traditionally mm -hmm. African-American, I think that people have been doing it. And so I guess 
the, the, my fantasy in, in my future yeah. would be would be that there's more access to financial resources mm -hmm. so that we're not mm -hmm. just <coughs> knocking on the doors of the institutions who are either trying if sometimes ineffectually to help us or um, or would rather we go away I would love to see us be able to build our own institutions and I've certainly sat on enough of these panels with enough brilliant people mm -hmm. that we sh we could figure it out, uh, but that we're poor artists who don't have time. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, Dan. Um, I think I, I may be naive, but I think we need to strive for a fearless theater. You know, th a theater that does not fear that it's not going to make money, it's not going to attract people, it's going to offend this people, it's going to offend that segment. I think if we are fearless and we have this. Um, central understanding of expressing, expressing someone's passion, I think we can get there. Ray? Well, could you restate the question? Just if you could imagine a theater, a better theater, a theater that, you would, that would make you happy, what that would look like. I think I'm just going to say well-funded again. <laughs> I mean, you know, it would be, I would think that, I think just like in the very simplest, simplest way, if we, if the American theater were a theater where the artists making theater could make a living just doing theater, I think that would change a lot of things in terms of access, diversity, the stories that are being on stage. If, if everyone could actually make a living doing theater and not doing theater and teaching and temping and, you know, whatever. Uh, I think that would change a lot. Okay. Kimber? I don't want anybody tweeting that I'm a socialist. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I am. Maybe I am. Maybe I should have known that. That's the most tweetable. But I feel like I would like to see some redistribution of the material resources of the American theater because what Lydia said is so important like there are theaters and people and companies who have been doing this work of trying to broaden the American theater for years and years and years um, but because of the way the resources are distributed they struggle so it would be really great to have a real invitation to everybody great well, we are out of time. I want to um, thank Sam French, of course, for having us in the Vineyard Theater and HowlRound, and most particularly um, uh, Kimber and Ray and Damon and Lydia. Thank you so much for uh, offering us.